This is Audiobook Warriors. AW presents an unabridged recording of Manacled by Senlin Yu, narrated by Katie Matthews and directed by Prana Opal. And now Manacled by Senlin Yu, Chapter 16. It was the middle of February when Dolores Umbridge was killed during the attempted assassination of the Minister of Magic. A statue of Voldemort was being unveiled at Hogwarts Prison to memorialise the final battle. Warden Umbridge was standing on a dais beside Minister Thicknees, while Thicknees gave a speech to the prison guards, reporters, and a handful of ministry officials in attendance. As the ribbon-cutting commenced, a crossbow bolt emerged from the Forbidden Forest, passed through the prison wards, narrowly missed the minister, and buried itself in the centre of Warden Umbridge's chest. She did not immediately die. Shards of a necklace and the shaft of the arrow slowed the bleeding. The guards, being ignorant of barbed medieval weaponry and basic medical sense, wrenched the arrow out. Then she died instantly. The attempt on the life of the popular three-term Minister of Magic sent shockwaves through the British magical community. The resistance terrorists had been regarded as wiped out. To have them re-emerge in such a spectacular manner brought chaos and had Death Eaters dressed in full regalia out in force. Voldemort took the attack as a personal insult. Montague's visits to the manor abruptly ceased. Astoria floated through the manor looking wan and paranoid. Hermione heard her shrilly asking Malfoy about exactly what kinds of protected wards were on the Malfoy estate. Malfoy, when Hermione caught glimpses of him, was constantly dressed in something that appeared to be a combination of combat gear and hunting clothes. He regularly returned to the manor, covered in mud and looking pale with rage. Hermione was thrilled. She read the news coverage obsessively. While the papers trumpeted loudly about how it was a failed assassination attempt, Hermione considered Umbridge's death far more appropriate than the intended target. Thickney's was little more than a puppet. Umbridge's sins were her own. But the satisfaction of retribution was insignificant compared to the relief of learning that the resistance was still alive. Hermione spent half an hour crying from sheer joy. She found herself feeling unexpectedly hopeful for the first time in a long, long time. The knowledge gave her a light step for days afterward. When Heila Stroud came to visit Hermione, her irritation that Hermione was still not pregnant became plainly visible. She cast a series of spells on Hermione and studied them thoughtfully. Well, your sodium levels seem to be improving, Heila Stroud finally said after several minutes of silence. Hermione stared at the clock and said nothing. Heila Stroud rummaged through a medical bag and pulled out a large flagon of a purple-coloured potion. Drink all of this. Stroud commanded. Hermione automatically brought it to her lips, even as she blurted out, What is it? Heila Stroud waited and didn't answer until Hermione had drunk the entire flagon. Fertility potion. It should have been necessary, but I'm out of ideas. You're not going to enjoy the side effects, I'm afraid, and it's going to increase your likelihood of multiple births. Hermione felt the blood drain from her face and felt as though she might fall off the exam table. The flagon slipped from her hand and shattered. Heila Stroud promptly banished the shards of glass. Expect breast swelling and tenderness, headaches, mood swings and swelling in your lower abdomen. It might also result in sensitivity to heat and cause your anxiety to re-emerge, Heila Stroud said as she added extra notes to Hermione's file. I'll inform the High Reeve. Hermione swallowed and bit on her lower lip as she stared determinedly across the room at the clock. Malfoy did not appear that day to inspect her memories. Hermione wasn't surprised. She had already anticipated it. Voldemort. Every other month until she was pregnant. When Malfoy arrived the next day, he looked tired and angry. He didn't say a word as he gripped her arm and apparated with her into the twisting tunnels leading to Voldemort's hall. The hall seemed even warmer and stank of rotting flesh. Hermione started gagging as soon as she took a breath. Malfoy seemed immune as he pulled her forward and knelt down, dragging her onto the stones beside him. The floor was damp and sticky, shimmering faintly. 
The room was almost pitch black. Only a few distant sconces provided any illumination. There were no other attendants or Death Eater's presence that Hermione could see. The mudblood, my lord, Malfoy said. There was a long, slow, sibilant sigh from the darkened dais, and then Voldemort's scarlet eyes suddenly appeared. Bring her forward, Voldemort said after a moment. Malfoy pulled Hermione forward and up the steps, before pushing her down onto her knees. Hermione stared in revulsion. The throne Voldemort had been seated on before was gone. He was instead reclined across an enormous nest of pythons that were all twisted together in the vague shape of a chair. They were entwined beneath him, undulating lazily. Voldemort cocked his head to the side and ran his spider-like fingers lightly over his chest as he studied Hermione thoughtfully. Still not pregnant, Voldemort said in menacing tones. Unfortunately not, my lord, Malfoy said with an apologetic voice. However, you will see the mind healers were correct, that time alone is sufficient to begin recovering her memories. Voldemort gave an irritated sigh, and a python head emerged from the moving mass of coils and rested on his lap. Voldemort lazily caressed the snake and sank further against the sliding coils beneath him. Hold her, Voldemort ordered. Malfoy's knee lodged itself between Hermione's shoulder blades and his hand wrapped around her jaw, holding her head in place. Hermione shook as Voldemort's scarlet eyes stabbed through her own and into her mind. Hermione could feel Malfoy's hand wrapped around her throat and jaw as she shuddered with pain. It felt as though Voldemort's legitimacy was a blade tearing through her mind. She screamed through her teeth. It was slower. Instead of hot, blinding agony, it was a gradual, more insidious pain, the kind that sank into the bones and the recesses of the mind and lingered. Voldemort lazily tore her memories to pieces, like a cat amusing itself with its prey. She hadn't known such a thing was possible. Bits and pieces of things he regarded as insignificant, he destroyed just to feel her react. Her memory of folding origami while her parents debated Eastern mysticism. Her discovery of the Granian in the stables. He shredded them into tiny pieces as though they were paper. She felt them go, tried to hold on to them as they faded away, but they slipped away until the agony in her mind made her forget what she was reaching for. He was fascinated by her memories of Ginny. When he withdrew from Hermione's mind, she collapsed against Malfoy and couldn't see anything but the angry red of Voldemort's eyes. Could she see? Or were his eyes simply burnt into her mind? Her brain hurt so much she almost expected to feel it dripping from her ears. Through the haze of pain that wouldn't fade away, she could feel her pulse fluttering madly against the pressure of Malfoy's palm. It's a pity you did not bring the Weasley girl back alive, Hermione heard Voldemort finally say. I'm sorry, my lord. I had no idea of her significance. As you recall, she was nearly dead when I found her. Hermione stirred faintly and whimpered, trying to rouse herself from the pain to listen carefully. It explains the Mudblood's attack in Sussex, Voldemort said in a musing tone. A suicide mission to free a dying friend. The order always was surprisingly predictable. Indeed. The disdain in Malfoy's voice was overt. There was a long silence. Malfoy's hold on her jaw loosened and Hermione felt herself slide down onto the floor. As she lay there, a cool muscular coil of a snake began slowly twining around her leg. I am disappointed by your lack of progress in finding those responsible for the attack, High Reeve, Voldemort said. There was a whisper of fury lacing his words. Hermione could barely breathe. The moist heat and the rot in the room was choking her, and the scales caught faintly on her stockings as the coil tightened around her calf. The python was sliding under her robes. She shuddered and tried to draw her leg away. She could barely make out anything in the darkened hall. Her inability to see left her highly attuned to the sounds of the hall, 
hissing and the soft shiver of sliding scales constantly shifting beside her in the darkness. I will not fail you. If it was the order, I will find them, Malfoy said. His voice was calm and resolute, deadly. Hermione felt her lips tremble and tears prick in her eyes. She felt her hands shaking as rage cut through her pain. There was nothing she could do. Malfoy could hunt down and murder someone in the middle of her bedroom if he wanted to, and Hermione would only be able to stand and watch. I hate you, Malfoy. I hate you. I hate you. It was the order. Who else would have known? That fool Slughorn must have told Dumbledore. Potter must have known. That was why he broke into Hogwarts. Someone was overlooked during the purge, someone significant to the order. Not one of their ignorant foot soldiers. I am certain the mudblood knows who it is. As Voldemort spoke, the sense of dark magic in the room grew thick, as though the air itself had become a solid, weighted mass bearing down mercilessly on Hermione. She could feel her ribs bowing under the pressure and crushing her cruelly into the stone. She was gasping as she tried to breathe through lungs that couldn't expand. Perhaps, my lord, it would be judicious to recall Severus, Malfoy said. His words sounded forced. Hermione was not the only one being crushed to death. No, Voldemort said in a cold voice. Romania is crucial. There would be questions if we were to recall Severus over an attempt on thick knees. Severus will remain in place. Have you learned how the locket came to be in her possession? The pressure eased slightly, and Hermione gasped and greedily dragged air into her lungs. The python coiled higher on her leg. She could feel the scales graze her bare skin above her stocking. A whimper of revulsion was torn from her throat, and she tried harder to pull away. A coil closed around her other ankle. I have been investigating quietly. There are ministry photos from 95 in which she appeared to be wearing it. She claimed it was a Selwyn heirloom. How she came to possess it no one knows, although a former secretary mentions the warden made a habit of relieving unlicensed peddlers of their possessions. So you know nothing. Not how the Order managed to destroy it from such an impossible distance. Not how they managed to identify it. Not even how she obtained it. Is there anything that you know? Voldemort snarled. Then he subsided for a moment before saying in a calmer, more threatening tone, You have disappointed me, High Reeve. I hope you have not forgotten what happened the last time you deeply disappointed me. Crucio! Hermione felt Malfoy suddenly drop. He had not fallen prone, but had instead collapsed into a crouch over her. She could feel his body shake rigidly from the torture, as a deep, guttural groan was wrenched from the back of his throat. Voldemort did not hold the curse for very long. In little more than a minute, it stopped. The shudders against her ceased, and Hermione heard Malfoy panting near her ear as he recovered himself. I will not fail you, my lord. I've had the broadhead and the remnants of the locket examined by a goblin, Malfoy said with only the faintest tremor in his voice as he started to stand up again. The broadhead was goblin-wrought silver, infused with a combination of venom from a manticore tail and basilisk venom. The manticore venom enabled the bolt to pass through the wards, the basilisk venom to destroy the locket. Have you investigated possible sources? Hermione felt the whisper of a tongue slip across her bare inner thigh and sobbed quietly. A juvenile basilisk is easy enough for any wizard with a toad and a talent for blinding hexes to obtain with patience. The source for manticore venom is more questionable, given how carefully most ingredients have been regulated since you seized control of the ministry. McNair insisted that he be responsible for the investigation into it, which was unusually generous of him. I privately interrogated one of his assistants. It would appear that there have been ongoing discrepancies in the logbooks regarding the quantities of some of his imported creatures. The black market has been quite profitable during the last several years. 
Send for him, Voldemort said. The fury in his tone was overt. The attack would not have been possible if not for his carelessness. Some of my servants seem to be growing hungry. As you command, my lord, Malfoy said, and Hermione felt him pulling her up from the floor. The python coiled around her legs, tightened its hold, and dragged her back down. Voldemort gave a sharp hiss, and it slowly released her with a sound of sibilant descent. As Malfoy pulled Hermione free of the coils, the sight of Voldemort swam into her vision. Several of the snakes had coiled around him. He was half covered in the pythons and staring at her carefully. That mud blood is traced with darkness. The snakes can taste it, and she is quite fecund. Voldemort said, wiping his lipless mouth as he studied her. Hermione stared back for a moment before her vision flickered away again. She could feel the faint tremors of torture in Malfoy's grip. Heela Stroud dosed her with some potion yesterday, Malfoy said. As for darkness, well, the trail of destruction reported in Sussex already indicated that she didn't adhere to the Order's policies regarding dark magic. Voldemort gave an assenting hiss. Watch her carefully. Now that the order is moving again, they are certain to come for her, Voldemort said. You know I will die before I lose my hold on her, Malfoy said in a low voice, and Hermione felt his grip on her arm tighten. I want their corpse, High Reeve. Whoever did it, this last order member. I want their skull added to my collection. You shall have it, as I had given you all the rest, Malfoy vowed. Hermione flinched and tried to wrench her arm free. Voldemort watched and she could feel the cruelty and malice in his gaze as his eyes slid across her. He opened his mouth and slid his tongue out as though tasting the air. His gums were white and toothless like a snake's and his tongue shimmered in the dim light. When he closed his mouth, he leaned forward and gave a low hiss. His face was centimetres from Hermione's. She could feel the whisper of air ghost across her face. She wasn't sure if he were about to lick her or perform legitimacy on her again. His blood-red eyes studied her for a moment before he sank back into the nest of pythons. Once the mudblood has given up all her secrets, I want her killed too. She knows too much to be kept in Stroud's program. Although, if she is pregnant, I will permit you to wait until you have your heir. As you command, my lord, Malfoy said without hesitation. Then he dragged Hermione out of the hall. Once they were in the winding passages, Malfoy dosed her with pain relief potion. Hermione scoffed quietly to herself before she swallowed it. She tried to clear her head, struggling to see. She felt as though the air in the hall had poisoned her. She slid weakly down onto the floor. Her brain was still in agony, even with the pain relief. Yet, she found herself teeming with questions. I attacked a prison? She forced out. After Potter died, Malfoy said in the darkness. A few hours after the final battle... You were captured after levelling nearly half of it in order to break in. It was an unexpected counterattack. I only read the reports on the damage after you were assigned to me. It's a pity no one bothered to interrogate you sooner. The overconfidence of victory, I suppose. Hermione looked up in the direction of his voice. She could only dimly make out his light-coloured hair before her vision slipped away again. She leaned her head back against the wall to steady herself. I was a healer, she said. I wasn't... They didn't let me fight. She furrowed her brow, trying to understand. But Ginny got out. I got her out. You did. But she was dying when you... When you killed her. Why? She asked, her voice small and pained. There was a silence before Malfoy spoke. She was in Sussex for experimental research. 
A low sound of horror tore itself from somewhere deep inside Hermione. The Dollarhobs Curse Development Division. Her voice shook and trailed off. She made out Malfoy nodding in the shadows. She doubled over and threw up. Oh God, Ginny. Malfoy waited for her to stop gagging before he dragged her up off the floor and apparated back into her room in his manner. The noise she made from the pain of the apparition was animal. She collapsed against Malfoy and discovered she was soaked in what appeared to be shiny, putrefied remains. She could only see it for a moment before her vision wobbled away again. She choked back a sob and tried blindly to wipe her hands off on her equally soiled robes. Malfoy muttered several cleaning charms and the smell around her faded. He shoved her back onto her bed. Three days, he said, and she vaguely heard him leave. Hermione wanted to stay conscious, so she could grieve and try to process what she'd learned, but her mind felt faded, like she couldn't quite reach. She pulled on her clothes until the buttons tore off and then shoved them onto the floor. She peeled the stocking off with her toes and tried to rub away the sensation of snake coils from her skin. It was two days before she could see reliably. The pain in her head prevented her from keeping any food down. The room swam when she tried to sit up or stand. She had nothing to do but think. When Malfoy walked in on the third day, she forced herself to sit up and look at him steadily. More questions, he said coolly as he surveyed her. Hermione shook her head. He looked faintly surprised. Well, one, I suppose, she said after a minute. Malfoy waited. She gathered up the threads of information, all the inconsistencies she'd collected in her mind over the months. She'd finally drawn them up into something cohesive. Hermione took a slow breath before she spoke. Then she met his eyes. The fanfare is in the light, but the execution is in the dark. The war has stalled, she said. Even though it's still officially ongoing in parts of Wizarding Europe, it's not being treated as significant or consequential anymore. In fact, based on the coverage, I suspect there's likely to be an armistice announced soon. In the past two years, aside from conquering Britain, there's been almost no progress since Harry died. Malfoy was silent, his expression carefully closed. In fact, almost nothing has happened since Harry died. Voldemort's entire campaign stalled once he defeated Harry, because... She hesitated only slightly. There was something connecting them. They were tethered somehow, probably from when he tried to kill Harry as a baby. That was why he and Harry would end up in each other's dreams sometimes. I'm sure you remember how Harry could speak Parseltongue. That's why when Voldemort used the killing curse to kill Harry at Hogwarts, it didn't work at first. Hermione's voice cracked and she swallowed hard and forced herself to continue. There was a new pain slowly starting to bloom through the back of her mind. She ignored it. That's why he had to recast the curse on Harry, because of the tether. But it wasn't just Harry. The way he's immortal, Professor Quirrell, the diary your father had, somehow your master figured out how to bind his life source to animate and inanimate objects. And the Order knew about it. That's why he knows the attack this month was the Order and not some new resistance group. Because the assassination attempt wasn't an attempt. Dick Knees wasn't the target. Umbridge wasn't either. The pendant she sometimes wore. The locket. I saw it when she was training us. It was his, one of his tethers. Whoever it is, the last Order member. They figured out what it was and killed her to destroy it. There was the faintest narrowing of Malfoy's eyes. Hermione cocked her head to the side as they studied each other. I believe I missed the question, Malfoy said after a moment. I haven't asked it yet, Hermione said calmly, trying to ignore the throbbing in the back of her head that was steadily growing as though there were a scalpel being driven into the base of her skull. The repopulation effort, she said, trying to breathe through the pain, is a cover it's a ruse. Voldemort doesn't care about the magical population. It's a piece of misdirection to keep the public preoccupied. 
He isn't waiting to enslave the muggles because he's concerned over wizarding demographics. He's doing it to buy himself time. He's entertaining the masses by making public spectacles of the pure-blood families, first with the marriages and the miscarriages, and now with surrogates. He didn't halt the war because he wants to. He did it because he has to. Pain shot through Hermione's head, and the room before her turned a horrifying shade of red, as though there were blood streaming down and filling her vision. She gave an agonised cry, started to fall forward, and forced herself to look up at Malfoy. He was moving toward her. She forced her question out. He's dying, isn't he? 